Just checking how the audio is working. It's working for me. Hello? Yeah, the audio is working for me. Anybody else? Oh, great. As long as if it's working, that great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for feeding back. Okay, we'll start in just a moment. I want to start um, kind of a question. I'm going to put a couple kind of questions throughout the presentation to help uh, gauge where people are at and what they're doing. And uh, everybody, I think, should be able to see the questions and answers. So um, that'll help us as we, as we go through. So we'll be ready to start um, any moment. So, well, let, um, I'll introduce myself while we're doing this first little poll. I'm Chris O'Brien. I'm with Exeter, and I'll be doing the uh, presentation today. Today we're going to talk about uh, IEC 61508 certification for mechanical devices, with a lot of the focus being um, on valves and actuators and, and final elements. So we'll kind of walk through what's driving the industry, uh, and then go into what the requirements uh, for manufacturers of valves are, um, valves and equipment, and how that benefits end users. So I'll just give another, you know, maybe another 30 seconds on this poll, and then we'll step into the um, into the into the slides. Alrighty, so um, let's go and start the slide presentation. As I mentioned, I'm Chris O'Brien. I'm with Exeter. I'm a partner with Exeter. And today we're going to take a look at 61508 and how it applies to mechanical devices. So the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is, you know, what's the driver for this and what's all this interest in all this um, discussion about safety and where is that coming from. So what we've seen, and I think probably everybody is seeing this, is um, more and more of a drive for SIL certified devices. And the things behind that are, first and foremost, the rate of industrial accidents is still very high um, and it's too high, which is increasing the focus on them. What, and what it also shows is that the traditional methods have not driven um, enough improvement. We're still having uh, significant accidents. It, the IEC standards, which we'll cover in a little bit of detail, are currently adopted as the state-of-the-art or best practice. And the process industry standards, specifically IEC 61511, or you know there are some, well, IEC 61511, or as it's been adopted by a country, um, that standard requires assessed products. So that is um, driving a lot of interest. And if we look at some of the accidents, there's always, um, unfortunately, there's always the large accidents that make national and international news, such as um, the BP Deepwater Horizon. Um, in addition to that, there's also many smaller accidents that might have one Two or you know a small number of fatalities, but happen much more frequently, and um, happen really throughout the world. So there's the large high visibility accidents, and then a large number of smaller accidents that continue to happen. What I have up here is just a, a screen capture of the Chemical Safety Board website. Uh, that's a that's a U.S. government thing where they they track and investigate accidents, but. It's a place that you can go to wherever you are in the world and take a look at what's going on in the U.S., but it just gives an idea of the wide variety of incidents and accidents uh, that are still going on. So 
um, it helps it helps ground everybody in, in the reality. So the need for the standard and why is there this need and why is there the focus is um, first its goal is to provide a safer work environment for people and, and essentially to save lives. I've got it up. Well, you got it up? Uh, can somebody go on mute? Uh, if I just would ask everybody to. Uh, thank you. I think somebody. Uh, yeah, I think I can mute you. So, all right. Um, if anybody has a question, please uh, feel free to ask it. Others, oh, let's check the Q and A. Okay, I'll try to check the Q and A uh, throughout. So, if there's a question, um, feel free to ask it during it or at the end. So, getting back to why is there a need uh, for standards? So, first and foremost, to save lives. Secondly, to protect the plant and the equipment, um, and essentially to save money. And then, thirdly to demonstrate compliance with regulatory requirements, and that is to avoid fines. So as a result of these accidents and and, um, and the losses associated with them, um, countries and governments continue to implement regulatory requirements that people use the functional safety standards to meet. The key standard, the umbrella standard, is IEC 61508. That was first released in 1998. Um, then the software portions of it were released in 2000, and there was a, an update uh, release in 2010. The process industry standard is IEC 61511 or um, ISA 84 in the U.S. Most other countries have adopted it, such as like the BS 61511 or the AS 61511. Um, that standard is a performance-based sta standard. Uh, it's not prescriptive. So we use that to distinguish between a standard that would say exactly how you have to implement something, which would be prescriptive, versus the performance, which tells you how to go about calculating and determining the risk reduction you need and how good uh, the system is that you've put in place. And it introduces the safety life cycle um, and the engineering process that goes along with it. The overall objective of these standards is to provide a framework to manage and execute the activities that are associated with uh, designing, implementing, implementing, and maintaining a uh, safety system or a system that provides protection against specific hazards. So IEC 61511, uh, excuse me, 508 uh, applies to suppliers of equipment. And IEC 61511 applies to um, basically end users and designers of systems, uh, the actual safety systems. There are other derivative standards that are used in the nuclear industry or the machinery industry or uh, for vehicles, automotives, automobiles. Um, but we're going to focus today primarily on IEC 61508 and IEC 61511. Now, IEC 61511 was introduced in late 2003 um, and, and really broadly picked up upon in 2004. And back at that point, we were tracking the adoption of the standard. So you can see before 2003, some companies were beginning to use IEC 61508. But after the industry-specific standard came out, there was a, an increased demand or increased adoption of that. So the adoption of end users using IEC 61511 is what's driving um, people to use or to request certified equipment. Some of the key issues that are uh, covered within IEC 61511 include the requirements for executing a project. So 511 talks about a safety life cycle and actually uh, talks about it in great detail. And the safety life cycle essentially is um, a, a process by which to, discuss, to analyze, design, implement, and maintain a safety instrumented system to protect against specific hazards. Uh, it has measures in there to protect against random failures, which we'll talk about in greater detail, and uh, to protect against systemic failures. 
has requirements for fault tolerances. So, for example, it talks about redundancy, and it also talks about independence between things that could cause an accident and the things that protect against it. It requires um, proven in use, a proven in use analysis, or IEC 61508 assessment for all equipment used in a safety function, and requires um, good requirements management and tracking. If we looked, if we simplified the safety life cycle, we'd look at three major steps. There's analysis step, which has to do with um, identifying the hazards and determining how much risk reduction you need. There's a design um, or realization step, which in which the safety functions will be designed. And then there's an operations and maintenance, which is after the unit or the process is running, where you're going to maintain and operate that safety function or safety system and make sure it's um, performing as well as it was when it was first put in. So 511, IEC 511 has three parts. Part one is the normative part, and it basically has the safety instrumented system requirements. Um, addresses the entire system to complete loop from sensor, logic solver, to final element. It um, requires a, a formal management of the process and of that equipment talks and shows how to do probabilistic um, targeting or determining how much risk reduction you need and talks about how do you calculate to see if you've met it and also how do you manage the software configuration of things such as your safety PLC. Sections two and three are informative parts. Section two provides guide, additional guidance on part one and section three gives some, some examples of risk evaluation and um, determining what SIL level you need. If we looked at what's it trying to achieve, essentially it's trying to put together all the steps, you know, to create a bridge to safety. So what are the safe operations? So there's some key elements such as planning and functional safety management. Then there's measures against systemic failure protection, measures against random failure protections. And then all these smaller supports are specific activities that need to be accomplished. We're not, this, this webinar is going to be focused on um, final elements and the certification of those elements, but the way that plugs into and, the, and the, where that comes from is safety instrument and system design and safety instrument or system verification. How do you design a system and know you can get the high degree of reliability and safety from it, and then how do you verify that? So we're going to be looking at these kind of support tables within the overall safety instrumented um, life cycle. So if we looked at the realization phase, which is going to be the first phase is people will determine how, what are their risky processes and how much risk reduction do they need. Then they're going to go into, um, and that first phase is the analysis phase. Then they're going to go into this realization phase. And in that point, there's going to be a concept for a safety instrumented function, which would be a function that, let's, let's say we're doing a boiler and we're concerned about loss of flame, the accumulation of um, uncombusted gases leading to an explosion. So that was identified during a plant HAZOP as a, as a concern. Um, a SIL target was established, and now a, a protective function to detect loss of flame and um, mitigate that's going to be mitigate it's going to be put into place. So there's going to be a conceptual design. So maybe we'll use a, a flame detector with a safety PLC connected to an independent shutoff valve. You're going to pick the technology to do it. You're going to pick the architecture, which is the redundancy. You're going to determine a test plan. Then you're going to do a reliability calculation and um, see what amount of risk reduction is achieved. If you've got enough risk reduction, that's great. You're going to go into detailed design. If you're not, you're going to circle back around. So to me, um, the output of the targeting would be, a, the output of the analysis phase would be a SIL target. And it might say, well, I need a SIL2 safety function with a minimum risk reduction of 500. To satisfy that or to show that that's been met, there's three things that that designer has to do. They have to look at the probability of failure or PFD average. Um, 
calculate that, and that's going to come from failure rates of the equipment. They're going to have to look at architectural constraints or redundancy, depending on what sill level they have and what type of equipment. And then they're going to have to look at the systematic capability of, of the equipment they're using in it. So those to do a full sill verification, those three areas need to be looked at. I'm going to do another quick little poll and kind of see where people are getting um, their data. So I should come up in a second if this works right. Okay, great. So kind of the question is, where do people, where, where, where do you get your data now when you do sill verification calculations? So if that's it just for um, time and give it 60 seconds or so. These aren't. Um, well, it's important, it's useful to know where data is coming from or where people are using it. It's kind of more just helps us get a feel for um, us being, myself and, and everybody attending, kind of where people have seen and get data from. So it's pretty, it looks like it's pretty well distributed, different. Um, so I guess we'll I'll give it another, give it a little longer, 30 seconds, see kind of how we come out. Okay, looks, we're, looks like we're settling down a bit. All right, so as we, three people got it from plant equipment. Uh, six people got it from studies such as ARIDA or, or CCPS, which is a Center for Chemical Process Safety. Uh, six people got it from field return from manufacturers, and nine people got it from a data book that Exeter puts out. So thanks for sharing that. Um, so there are, as you can see from that question and that response, and there, there's probably things that I forgot, um, multiple places to get um, data. There's some, if we looked at benefits and drawbacks of different places. So the, the best place, if you've got good plant data, that's the best place to get it because it's going to be the equipment in your environment with the data. The challenge there is to really get meaningful data, you've got to have pretty, um, pretty well-established periodic testing that's going to find, uh, that's going to thoroughly test the equipment that you record over a period of time so you can get a, a valid um, failure rate from that. Challenge is that most plants do not have a data collection place uh, in place uh, that's sufficient to do that. So many plants will have it after something fails or record why it failed and, and put that in a database. Really to collect the kind of data that you need for uh, these reliability calculations, you would need to be doing essentially proof testing on all that equipment, is testing it periodically before it's failed and recording its um, its state. Another place, uh, a prominent place to get it is uh, FMEDA, Failure Modes Effective Diagnostic Analysis. That's kind of an analytical analysis done on a product uh, where you might not have the failure rate for that specific product, but you can get failure rates for resistors or for packing or for plugs or for valve bodies and build the product up from its component. So that's good in that it allows you to model a lot of different products. A weakness is that it um, doesn't take into account plant-specific stresses. You know, some plants might be have lower failure rates, some might have higher, so that doesn't get captured in an FMEDA. I um, mean, a third place is a manufacturer mean time between failure or that reliability data. And that's poor, I would say it's poor, not because the manufacturers aren't accurately recording their field returns and reporting them to you, it's that they can only report what comes back. So in these safety systems, if we took a, um, a failure mode of a stuck valve stem, well, you don't know, even at the plant, so somebody might try to cycle that valve. So one, you'd have to do a test. You'd have to try to cycle the valve to find the failure. 
two, you'd have to make sure that maintenance doesn't go out there. Oh, if it doesn't move the first time, go out there and loosen it up and test it again. Some plants might catch that as a failure. Some plants might not have the procedures in place to catch that as a failure, and they might just fix it on as they're doing so they can keep the plant running. So the manufacturer may not get all that failure. The end user may not discover and report all those failures, and even if they are discovered by the end user, they may not get reported back to the manufacturer. So that manufacturer data is going to tend to be optimistic just because they don't know of all the failures. So if we looked at um, FMEDA, which is a technique that's an IEC 61508, you essentially start with component failure data, and that would be a part such as um, a valve stem and it would have a failure rate, how often does it fail, and a failure mode. Does it does it break, does it stick? From that, you build up a model of the equipment, and that's an FMEDA, and then you can get failure rates and failure modes um, and test coverage across a device such as a valve or an actuator or a solenoid or a PLC. Then you put those together and do your PFD calculation, and then you um, that goes into... Uh, the reliability calculation for uh, PFD average. We've got a question. Um, I have a question here. What safety margin for failure data should we take from these sources as plant data are not easy to get? Okay, that's an excellent question. So basically, the question is, all right, boy, if we had perfect plant data, we would, um, well, even with plant data, 61508 would say you would do a 70% confidence factor on um the data. So essentially, 61508 says 70% confidence factor of data. So for plant data, you would do the same thing. Um, now, depending on your sample size, your, your population size, your number of failures, um, the, the margin or the, uh, the um, safety factor is going to be different based on just normal reliability calculations. For FMEDAs, the failure rates, the component failure rates, are set with that uh, confidence factor into these rates. So these rates are conservative by nature and then feed into the FMEDA. For field return data, um, what we do at Exeter, so like when Exeter, when we do an FMEDA, we will do an FMEDA, and if we're doing a product assessment, we will also look at the manufacturer's field return data because that is a very valuable source of data. But we would say they probably get 10 to 30 percent of failures are returned to them. So we, we only look at things within 12 months of shipment, so we don't give credit for more than 12 months. And we say of that, they maybe know of 10 to 30 percent of the failures that occurred. So we'll, you know, we'll typically do like a 3x multiplier on that failure rate that comes from the OEM data and then do a kind of a, a qualitative validation of the FMEDA because they should be about the same order of magnitude when we, when we gross up the um, OEM data. So that data is going to, you're going to get your data, you're going to put that in there, you're going to do a, a still verification calculations and um, then also look at architectural constraints and capability, which are two other things. Now, you can use um, for, for the PFD, you're gonna, you, need a, you need data source. I mean, PFD is a calculated value, so you've got get, to have a source of data. For architectural constraints, that's pretty straightforward. Depending on the device type, you're going to have redundancy requirements. Device types and... There's a 511 way to do it and a 508 way to do it. So depending on which one you use, you're going to get, um, you're going to calculate and meet your architecture requirements. And then for seal capability, um, you can use an assessed product or you can do proven in use. And basically, um, what that does is it's putting the requirement on the user of the product to collect the data and make the argument that that device is sufficiently free of uh, failures to use in a, in a safety instrumented system. So the user has the burden. We talked already about how it's difficult to collect meaningful data. And if you get up to a SIL 3, 61.511 requires a formal functional safety assessment um, Essentially, you know, per um, 
essentially kind of having the end user do a 61508 assessment on equipment. So the, the words in 61511 are a formal functional safety assessment for SIL-3 applications. And then you go, well, where would you find out how to do that? Well, you find out how to do that by reading 61508. So it becomes, um, it's, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to do. And that's another reason many customers are looking for, uh, many end users are looking for certified product. So if we look at meeting those requirements, we look at SIL capability. That's a strength against systematic failures, and you can do that either by using a certified product or doing the proven and use analysis. If you look at probability of failure on demand, that's a strength against random failures, and PFD calculation is how you satisfy that. And if you look at architectural constraints, you're going to – essentially, that's strength against an undetected failure because the, the more dangerous undetected failures you have, the – the more redundancy you need. So you do that by calculating, say, failure fraction and implementing redundancy. So those are kind of the, the three things you need to do to meet a SEAL capability. Now, if we look at kind of applying the standards, IEC 61508 is a standard that applies to manufacturers of devices, and IEC 61511 applies to users of those devices. So people designing and implementing safety instrumented systems, um, so integrators, users, uh, engineering firms. Looking at 508, basically IEC 61508 applies to automatic protection systems. So it's written that it provides electric, electronic, or programmable electronic systems. And a logical question is to say then, well, why why are we worrying about valves and actuators when we're talking about a system design for automated systems? Um, and that's a very good question, but the standard is, you know, from the IEC, in every case, the standard applies to the entire E slash E slash P safety related system. For example, from sensor through control logic and communication system to final actuator, including any critical actions of a human operator. For safety functions to be effectively specified and implemented, it is essential to consider the system as a whole. So the reason it applies is you could have a great sensor, a great safety PLC, and if your valve won't close, you can't bring the process to a safe state. So that's why it rolls in everything required um, to execute and operate the system. Provides measures and means to protect against uh, random and systemic failures and can be applied either at a project or a product level. Now, if there wasn't an industry standard such as IEC 61511, so if you were an industry that didn't have that standard, you would probably just apply 508. But since uh, the process industry has IEC 61511, we're pretty much going to look at it only at the, at the product level. And the product is the sensor, the transmitter, or the valve, or the actuator. 61508 addresses some major issues. And um, by looking at accident causes, um, really, that was really the driver for coming up with the safety life cycle. Uh, we have another question, so let me just check what that is. Uh, there's a question about what what is the section in 508. I think that I'm, I'm guessing that it's a, applying to this previous slide and this previous excerpt. Oh, this is off the 61508. Uh, sorry, this is off the IEC 61. I, this is off the IEC website with um, questions and guidance on application of 61508. So it's not. This is not out of the standard, this verbiage, but the entire system is covered within the standard. I think that answers, hopefully that answers that question. If not, please um, help me understand it a little better. Um, so 508 looks at safety management, uh, technical requirements, and competency of people as means or ways to avoid um, failures of the safety systems. So that's driven the safety life cycle, and that's driven certification or assessment of the process, uh, safety process, equipment, and um, even people with different testing. 
So current usage, there's a 61511 for the process industry. There's uh, ISO 26262 for automotive. There's uh, machine control, which is IEC 62061. Uh, there's mining machinery, there's elevator controls. So there's a lot of, uh, this standard has really been adopted and implemented in many different um, industries, and it's been implemented on a, on a global scale. So the objective, you know, so what's the objective? The objective of certification is to verify the equipment is designed in accordance with uh, the safety requirements of the standard. and the goal or the result should be safer design, that is designs with lower inherent uh, failure rates, and also designs that are valid for use or implementation uh, around the world. Uh, North America, South America, Europe, Asia, um, this is the standard pretty much that everybody's using. A, a common thing that's going to be looked at or have to be addressed is the safety integrity level. And fill or safety integrity level can be used three ways. Uh, first, it's used to establish risk reduction requirements. Second, it's used to establish probabilistic limits, which is uh, what, what's the calculated um, reliability of a system. And third, it's used to establish uh, the rigor for the um, procedures needed in engineering to prevent systemic design errors. So if we look at 508, it's going to have requirements for a detailed, detailed engineering process, which really goes to design reliability, and also um, performance requirements based on probabilistic analysis. So the, the life cycle or the process is focused on minimizing and driving down systemic design faults or design mistakes. And the probabilistic performance requirements are there to control and manage the random failures. And by having a low likelihood of a systemic fault in a product and a low likelihood of a random failure, that is how the high reliability is achieved. Now, if we look here, I'm gonna, so we can say, well, random failures, all right, I've got, um, well, let's take a plant. So there's a plant. It's got 100 safety instrumented functions in it. Each function has a valve in it. Each valve has an actuator. And for this design, they've got an actuator with three springs, um, because that's how they picked it. And for that actuator to close the valve at operating conditions, all three springs need to be there. That's how the actuator is designed. So you've got 300 springs in the plant. And there is some probability of failure of getting a, that the spring would fail, some failure rate for the spring. And you say, okay, given my plant and given an operational time of 30 years, the probability that I'm going to get an actuator failure due to a spring breaking will be a specific number. So that's pretty clear. You know, it's pretty easy. People say, yeah, we can understand that that's a requirement and why we need to calculate it. But, geez, why for a valve? What, what's, what really could go wrong with a valve or actuator that we wouldn't know about? Well, here's a, um, a real-life example that we found about probably about five years ago, and I was actually just working with another manufacturer about a month ago. And <laughs> the, issue. Um, the issue was, and this is an example of a systemic fault. They use a uh, leading 3D design software to do their valve design. From that, they generate um, drawings and files. Either Some people use it to automatically generate machining files. Some use it to generate drawings. And those drawings go either in-house or outside for parts to be manufactured. Uh, this first example was it was a shutoff valve manufacturer. Been making the valve probably for 20 years. Upgraded their design tool, their CAD tool. Made, continued to make valves. Everything tested fine in the shop, and it was a proven design. So they said, hey, our valve's fine. We, we make it. Um, then after about two years, a customer complained that one, one of the valves did not close on com command. They had an, they had an um, issue where the system needed to shut down. The isolation valve didn't close. When they looked into it, um, 
they found that the tolerances on the drawings for making the parts had changed, and that fault came from upgrading their CAD package. There was an issue with the, with the latest version of the CAD tool where the tolerances disappeared from the drawings, and so the parts came in, and often, often, uh, a, a company will have a, a, a requirement. They'll have like they'll have their normal uh, tolerances. If if nothing specified, they go plus or minus whatever their standard design tolerance is. Or they'll use what the print says, and depending on the decimal points or the tolerance grade, they'll use that. So these parts were being made um, per print, which had no specified tolerance, which means when they got in service and installed and up to temperature and things got hot and expanded, they wouldn't close. Um, and I had the same issue come up about four weeks ago doing another audit a completely different uh, valve company, and they were getting a 50% failure. These weren't safety valves at the time, but they were getting a 50% close part rejection of the valves. And when they looked into it, the tolerances were not on the drawing, and it was the same issue. So that's an example of a systemic uh, flaw that gets into every product, and if the conditions are right, um, those products won't work. So IEC 61508 has means and measures to protect against that. So specifically, IEC 61508 says that any of your software-based design tools have to be version controlled and have to be uh, verified as fit for use in a safety uh, to design a safety system. So what you would do is you would, in this case, you would take a CAD package, you would use it, you would get the confidence of use from using it on non-safety critical applications, and then you would not change it or upgrade it um, until you validated that the new version didn't introduce an error and was as reliable, if not if not more reliable, than the existing one. So there's, you know, there, that's just an example of the uh, systemic fault that happens in mechanical devices. Um, yeah, I think we got that. Okay, so random faults. Random faults come from, uh, as I mentioned, like a part or a component failing. Um, 61508 has requirements uh, for design that require random failure rates for each failure mode to be available. So that's, you've got to, the supplier of the device to you has to give you failure rates and failure modes, whether they're fail safe, fail dangerous, and then um, you can use that for your your PFD calculations. Now, years ago, not years ago, I mean, historically, the source of that data was either cycle testing or field failure studies. There's some challenges with those two things. So cycle testing. Cycle testing is a specific way of, um, you know, it, you're going to test the part to failure, and you're basically looking for wear out. Now, many mechanical things like valves or switches or relays are tested that way as normal development, but that's to determine their life, and they're often to tested. Um, they're tested to find, you know, what's going to what's going to fail, what's going to be the dominant failure uh, cause, and then what's the um, it's called like the beta number, so it can like be beta 10. And in this case, it's not common cause, like in reliability, but for mechanical engineering, a beta 10 would be how many, what's the life where 10 of the population is there? And, and beta 10 would be a typical thing to calculate. Now, you can imagine that um, for a safety system, Having 10% of the population fail is not a valid number. Even having 1% of the population fail for wear out is not valid. So that is a test that's good for a high cycle demand application, but it's not applicable to demand such or low demand applications such as safety system, because it's not going to take into failure modes like stiction, which is, you know, saying the metal, the metal spool in a, a solenoid valve sticking and binding to an O-ring, um, cold well. Welding, sorry, that would be the O-ring in the metal, uh, corrosion, etc. So those are long-term failures that could happen over the life of a safety device that a cycle test is not going to find. And you're going to, what happens with cycle testing is you wind up with very, um, uh, very optimistic uh, numbers. 
field failure studies. Again, uh, we talked about the challenge that OEMs have in getting complete data. Um, so if you've got enough data, that's great and you can do it. Um, but the problem is most things that we've looked at uh, pretty much everything we've ever seen, and we work on a couple industry committees as well trying to get data, is getting valid and uh, enough data that's valid. Um, and it's just it's just what's available. It's just the reality. This uh, this Pareto here kind of shows, it's on, well, it's, it's, it's a histogram, sorry, shows field returns for a manufacturer who did a very good job of uh, tracking it, but you can see it's dominated, you know, no problem found. Now, that could be, um, especially with a product that has software in it, often a software problem or a bug could re can reset on power cycling. So it could have been a real problem. The device could have malfunctioned. But when the power cycles, it goes through startup diagnostics, it resets all the registers, and now it works. So it really is a no problem found, but the, it wasn't that there wasn't a problem. It's just that it's cleared. Um, so there, in this case, this was a, this was a, um, a flame detector. Weak source tube was a part that would wear out, so there was an internal diagnostic. Uh, over voltage, which is customer misuse. They had some random component failures. Uh, they had other sources of customer misuse and then some product conversion. So you can see these are all returns, but the ones that really would affect random reliability are here. So FMEDA is by far, I think, the, the, the most broadly used technique. Um, you get enough statistical um, um, – it's difficult to get the, the top-level data. So you break it, the, the device down into smaller parts, like a body, a plug, uh, a seat, a stem, and you use the failure rates for those parts, and you build it up. So if we looked at if we look at sources of data, we talked about um, I'll call like a cycle test or laboratory test kind of an ideal source of data if or an ideal um, situation. If everything's perfect, um, then you're going to get an extremely low failure rate. If you eliminate everything like from the environment or stresses it's going to see, which a cycle test tends to do by the way they're run. If you look at generic sources of data, such as ARETA or um, um, RAICS, they've got a lot of different um, – they haven't done – like an ARETA is going to be a small – set of data, usually just because that's all that exists, and it really isn't scrubbed to say, was this a random failure, was this a misapplication, was this an end-of-life failure? So ARETA tends, or those studies tend to have high failure rates, and FMEDA kind of tends to be in the middle. I took and um, did a study and looked at um, a bunch of failure data for solenoid valves. And we were able to get um, several – this was – one of these is ARETA, these, these failure rates, these high failure rates. One of them was RAIC, which is a, um, a military handbook, military database in the U.S. It's published. One is ARETA. So we're looking at, you know, 20,000 years to 80,000 years uh, – or sorry, 20 to 80,000 failures per billion hours is what those studies said. This was a cycle test on a solenoid which said its failure rate was 0.47 fits. So it said this entire solenoid valve had a lower failure rate than a simple resistor. And then here was a series of different solenoid designs that we had FMEDA studies on. Um, this is kind of expected because some solenoids are very simple. They might be a simple poppet. Some are spool solenoids with multiple um, ports. And then there was a detailed plant study we were able to get. So. FMEDA isn't going to give you perfect data, but it's going to give you reasonable data that matches field experience and, and kind of matches uh, what would be expected. I'm going to skip a couple slides. 
It's going to show you. So the FMEDA, or the data is going to give you safe and dangerous failures and whether they can be detected um, or not, depending on what type of diagnostic is implemented. That data is what you need to put into your safe failure calculation and your PFD calculation. So you're going to have, you have the data to do that part of the SIL verification. Um, and to say failure um, actual calculation. So if you're looking at what does a manufacturer do to get through a certification or to achieve certification, uh, there's going to be a hardware requirement, a PFD average target. Um, essentially, you need low failure rates, fail-safe design, and, uh, and high diagnostic <laughs> average rates things improve um, point one. You're going to need to meet, say, failure fraction targets. If there's software in a product, um, then you need to have a software development process in place. Even if, let's say, it's a purely mechanical device, uh, you're going to need control of your design tools. And they could be, you know, Excel tools that you use to calculate uh, stem forces. They could be uh, 3D CAD tools you'd use to do the design. Um, they could be computational fluid dynamic tools you use to look at um, plug forces or flow rates. All those things, or, or CVs, all those things are going to be under control. And even in the final element world, there are devices that have software, smart valve positioners, um, automatic uh, partial valve stroke test devices. So there are some final element devices that have software in them. So that has to be addressed. Um, and then at a product level, you've got to look at uh, the design process. Um, excuse me, at a, at a process level, you have to look at the development process and make sure that meets 61508, and then create the proper documentation, such as a safety manual for users. So what does that mean? You need a documented life cycle for safety. You need the requirements. You need specific requirements called out for safety-related functions. You need a validation plan. You need to define the architecture. These next three are grayed out because they, depending on how much software you have in deployed, you're going to need a qualified set of tools. Um, you're going to need a coding standard if you're doing embedded coding. You're going to need to follow your coding standard. And ultimately, you're going to need to verify uh, compliance with your, your process and your, um, your methods. So if we looked at... Um, we did a quick kind of look at what does um, what would a project what what is it, what a customer process or an OEM process look like for um, a SIL rated product? You're going to have a project plan. Often it's the functional safety management plan of developing a SIL rated product. You're going to have specific product requirements, including calling out the safety related requirements, those functions that are safety critical. Then you will have a set of requirements, which you'll need to decompose. You'll say, okay, the valve will be a tight shutoff valve that meets class five. The valve will, depending on its size, will have these torques or these uh, closing forces. So you'll generate, you know, the requirements that are safety related. You'll design those and you'll test and validate or verify that each requirement is met. Then you'll integrate and make the valve or the actuator, or the final element assembly, and show that that um, entire device meets the requirement. Create the documentation for end, for the users, such as the safety manual is the key one. Then you're going to manage change. You're going to look at field returns over time to make sure nothing. For example, we talked about that software issue that got in there. If they weren't... Um, tracking their customer feedback, they wouldn't find those types of errors. And so you'll look at field return and do field return analysis. You need a procedure in place for internal change requests, uh, customer requests, and you need to control the source of purchased parts. Because another common, somewhat common source of um, errors are changing the supplier or changing uh, a vendor for a critical part and now, even though it's bought per print, it doesn't behave identical to the one it replaced. And then finally, obsolescence or replacement of a new, by a new product. 
typical documents that are um, um, kind of required as part of certification is you you know you need your overall development process, you need functional safety management procedures, you need um, a verification plan, verification results, um, training procedures, training records. And I think we'll send out a copy of all these slides are going to be available, so don't worry if anybody's trying to take notes, please don't try to take notes. But this is kind of a typical list of documents that a um, that go along with a, being able to have a product certified. Um, being a little conscious of our time. So if we looked at how would you flow through? How's, how's a typical certification project happen? If you've got, you kind of got two branches. You've got a branch that looks at the source and the capability from a random failure. And if you've got a more complex system, such as a, you know, a gas, a pipeline isolation valve system where you've got um, stored gas, you've got a foul shut valve. You might have multiple components, so you might do a system FMEA and then do FMEDAs, um, and this would be the random branch. And then on the systemic branch, on the process side, you'll start with a gap analysis and training, create a safety case. Um, i got a question. I'm going to check a question. Um, oh, there's two I missed. Sorry. First was EXA has various certification levels and what the end users Oh, and what, I think the question is what level should an end user look at when um, selecting hardware? Essentially, you need to select it to meet your SIL level. So if you only have a SIL 1 requirement, then a SIL 1 capable device is fine. Um, if you have a SIL 3, then you've got to pick a, a SIL 3 capable device. Uh, another question was, can you give advice on total PFD for a valve consisting of valve body, actuator, and solenoid valve? Okay, so the normal rule of thumb is you're going to budget 50% of the PFD uh, value for the final element. So now what happens is if you're a SIL-1, it tends to be wind up being on average higher than that because your sensor and logic solver uh, will hardly contribute any. If it's SIL-3, it actually tends up being um, about that because you're going to need redundancy and you have a lot more contribution. So um, I don't have it off the top of my head, but you could just back, cal back calculate. If you took, say, SIL-2 with a risk reduction of 1,000, you'd say, so you need a PFD of 0 0.001, and then you'd say, I'm going to take half of that budget for my final element, so that's 0 0.0005 is my PFD average, and then work back um, to some failure rates. Something that has a big impact, um, one thing you want to consider in doing that is are you going to implement partial valve stroke testing, um, how frequently are you going to test, and how much are you going to test. So you get much more, let's say you're going to do an annual leak test, you're going to get extremely good coverage on all the whole, um, you know, the, you can trip it, you can trip the valve, see that it closes in the time expected and then do a leak test and you're going to get you know 99% coverage of the solenoid, 99% coverage of the actuator, you know 99% coverage of the valve. So you're going to have a very good full test. If on the other extreme you say, you know what, I'm going to do a, um, I don't want to shut my process down, so I'm going to do a partial valve stroke test once a year and a full valve stroke test every five years, but no leak test, you're going to have dramatically different um, PFD results for the identical equipment. So um, the, the test interval and the test regime has a pretty dramatic uh, impact on what's achieved. So when you're looking at your equipment, you want to think about those things as well because they can, they can have as much if not more impact than the actual equipment you select. Um, so if we look at certification, so a certification results in the supplier gets a certificate, 
Um, however, that alone is not enough. Implementing it, you're going to want to look at uh, the safety manual because it's going to there could be some restrictions, and those will be limited in the safety manual. So just picking certified devices by themselves um, isn't going to ensure that you achieve what you're hoping to. You've got to really do uh, that checking. Check this another question. Okay, so here's a good question. What what are the issues for designers if we use valves made up of certified components from different suppliers? Okay, well, there really isn't any because what gets certified are <coughs> the devices, so the valve, the actuator. Now, whether you bought all of those from one company or you bought them from other ones, your seal verification calculation is going to – uh, properly take should properly take into account the failure rates. You'll want to look if there's any failure rates you need to add for the assembly. Um, but even more important than those failure rates and the modest effect they might have, it's being sure you test the final assembly. So, for example, the switches are located in the right position. It, it rotates freely. It's been assembled correctly. So the the issues there's really no issue of um, there's no unique issue of combining parts from different suppliers, the key thing is to do that assembled test, in my opinion. Make sure you do an assembled test, whether it's from one supplier or from different suppliers, uh, to, to show that those that equipment was put together correctly and is, is meeting your requirements. Um, okay, so Exeter helps companies with certification. I think we're just about out of time, and I noticed some people are dropping off. So, um, safety-related market trends are more and more uh, end users are adopting the standards. It's driving a demand for certified product. Uh, if we look at these are sensors, but if we look at um, kind of the trend in safety-related sensors, and it's even more dramatic for valves. That's just continues continues to go up. A good place to find uh, devices that I would recommend to anybody is we have what's called a safety automation equipment list, and um, we list every component that we know that's got a valid uh, cert certification. So you can find different actuators, different valves, different equipment on there. and. Um, Yeah, so you can you can do that. So I guess at this point I'd like to open it up for um, questions and feedback. We're just about at the hour time, so I've got one more poll on how do we do in uh, meeting require your um, expectations, and also I'd open it up for questions through the um, either through audio or um, the Q and A. We will be sending out the um, <coughs> me. we will be sending out the uh, slides. Oh, someone just asked, can you send it? Yep, we can send out the uh, we'll send out the um, PowerPoints as a PDF to everybody who attended. And if you have any questions, I think um, uh, I'll send my email as well. Uh, you can ask me or anybody else you know from. Exit up. Okay, so what would you recommend um, to do in a facility with products and looking for compliance? I would often what I recommend, um, Louise, and um, you can shoot me an email as well, and I can I can reply to that. But I recommend doing what we call kind of a benchmark study of what your procedures are. And then, um, you know, that's kind of a short two or three day study. And from that, you get where you're compliant and where you've got a gap. And then you kind of prioritize based on that. So the first thing is to get, to get a snapshot of where you are against the requirements of the standard. And then you can develop a more uh, focused plan. And it will take time. You're not going to get there overnight, uh, but you could prioritize the act. You could look at 
geez, these are the things. We're not doing this at all. We're not doing tracking of failures. We're not doing proof testing. We're not, we're not requiring safety certification for any of our devices. And then you kind of come up with a, with an action plan on how to address that. So that would be my recommendation. I can send you a little more information on that if you'd like. Just shoot me an email. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you. Um, give it another minute, see if anybody. Can I ask a question, please? Absolutely, yes. Uh, this is Tony Hopkins in the UK. Um, do you have any uh, advice on, um, you quote figures for valves and clean service on the test. Do you have any sort of guidelines of what we would use for valves that are not in clean service? Yes, we actually, like in our, in our FMEDA analysis, we also publish the data for severe service. So um, what we've done is we've taken and we consider severe service some type of abrading fluid. And we look at the process wetted parts and essentially double the failure rates of those components. So the valve, you know, a gasket for the bonnet to the body isn't going to fail more frequently or the valve casting itself isn't going to fail more frequently, but you're going to get a higher failure rate on the stem, on the plug, on those parts. So we published that, um, and it's, it's it, it it pretty it increases it doesn't double the failure rate of the whole device because not all parts are doubled, but it does increase the failure rate and it kind of gives you at least a um, a bounding. You could look at you know clean service and then severe service and Get a get a feel for um, for that, and then there are some valves that are designed with you know there are a few severe service valves. And I'm just remembering, I think Dresser had um, I don't know if they call it their Lincoln Log valve, but there's a, a couple of valves they've got designed. And I'm not pushing Dresser; I'm just remembering them. Dresser made some because that was one I remember working on where it was designed and had different clearances. And it was designed for bad. Um, Condition, so it might be, you know, it's not going to be as good as a, a ball valve and clean service, but it, it's more tolerant because of its design. So we try to factor that into the FMEDA. Would your service be abrading or plugging or? Well, we're consultants, so we deal with a, a lot of different um, types of service, but um, very rarely clean service. So I guess we need to pick a value <laughs> in between. <laughs> well, you, you, you would, I mean, I would. Um, yeah, I mean, if you had a really, if you had, you know, the entrained sand and all that type of stuff, I would probably use the severe service. If you had, you know, we don't think it's quite as bad as the worst, you know, uh, well service we've seen, but we know it's not as good as clean. Yeah. Uh, then I'd go in between. Okay, um, thank you. Okay. Here's another question. Some suppliers have advocated final elements that are still to and have TV certificates, but are not able to supply data to back up these devices. Um, is there an organization to weed out those that might have been granted certificates? There really isn't. Uh, what we do, the one thing we try to do is we um, we That safety automation equipment list, we publish that, and we only we review the certificates or whatever they have, and if we think it's not credible, then we don't um, we don't list them. So, I think the question would be for any user or somebody is to say exactly what you're asking, William. Is okay. What is the I've seen I've seen TV certificates that say SIL 4, which doesn't even apply in 61.511. So you say, okay, great, you've got a certificate. You should also have a detailed FMEDA report or failure rate analysis, and you should also have a detailed assessment report that shows um, all the steps that the assessing body went through. So they should be able to give you not just a certificate, but a detailed assessment report and a detailed failure analysis that would back up that, those claims. And if they can't, then you could just say, well, that we, need, we require more data than that. But there is, no, there is no clearinghouse for people granting certificates, unfortunately. All 
Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions, so um, we'll get the uh, presentations out, and uh, thank everybody for attending.